let me welcome you to the very beginning of yet another exciting small group series here at the Church of Eastern Oaks. If you're watching this online, you can join us live any Sunday at 9.15 as we do these, uh, these small group series live. And we have several different adult classes that you can choose from. But if you're watching online, we welcome you back. And uh, we thank you for joining us. Today, we are starting a brand new series on the Old Testament book of Esther. Esther is one of the all-time great stories from the Old Testament. And so we're really going to enjoy looking at this together. Today, uh, again, we started the book of Esther. And the name of our study is Esther, Proof God Works in Mysterious Ways. That's what we're calling our series, Esther, Proof God Works in Mysterious Ways. Now, I imagine everyone is familiar with the phrase, God works in mysterious ways. We've heard this uh, countless times throughout our lives. But what do we mean? What, what does that mean when we say that God works in mysterious ways? Well, basically, the expression refers to the simple truth that God is smarter than we are. That's really what we're talking about, okay? Furthermore, if God is who God says he is, it shouldn't surprise us that he's smarter than we are. And so because he's smarter than we are, his ways seem mysterious to us because we can't always understand them. You see, we believe God is many things, but we believe God is, is two things uh, that are applicable to what we're talking about today. We believe God is omnipotent. That means God is all-powerful. He can do whatever he wants. It also, we also believe that God is omniscient, which means God is all-knowing. So if God is all-powerful and God is all-knowing, and we are neither of those things, we are not all-powerful and we're not all-knowing, then we should expect God is going to work in ways that we can't understand. And that's what we mean when we say, that God works in mysterious ways. We're talking about the fact that God is often at work behind the scenes doing things that we do not know, things that we never see until the end. And then we look back and we say, wow, God works in mysterious ways. He is smarter than us. He is more powerful than us. God sees the beginning from the end. When we say God works in mysterious ways, this truth is best summarized probably in the passage of Scripture from Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 55, the Lord is speaking. And in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, the Lord says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Again, because God is both omnipotent and omniscient, he knows the end from the beginning, and he is able to manipulate events to arrive at whatever conclusion he desires. We don't always understand it. We don't always see him working in the background, but he's there, and he is working. All right. In the grand scheme of salvation history, we see this most clearly in the life and in the work of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay? Uh, from before the dawn of time, God knew exactly what was going to happen. God knew if he created humans, that they were going to sin, and they were going to need a Savior. And yet he created them anyway. God created Adam and Eve knowing they would sin. And when they did, he wasn't surprised, and he merely put into place the plan which he had planned from the beginning of time. Okay? Uh, when we look at Jesus' time here on earth, for instance, there are many events which appeared at the time to jeopardize God's plan. So, for instance, from the very beginning, Jesus' birth, you have Herod out to kill Jesus and issues the decree to kill all the children in Bethlehem. Right? And yet, God's plan still succeeds. You have Satan's temptation of Jesus in Matthew 4. Again, trying to derail God's plan, and yet God's plan still succeeds. You have the death of Jesus, which again, many thought, hey, we've, we've ended Jesus. He's over. He's done for. 
and yet that was God's plan all along. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was in charge, that's not the way I would do things. I don't know about you, but the, the way that God works sometimes is just, it's unbelievable. It is mysterious. We are unable to comprehend his ways because he is omnipotent and because he is omniscient. God is able to use any event for his glory. Yes, God works in mysterious ways. God works in ways that we cannot understand and we often cannot predict. However, our responsibility is not to understand all of his ways. Our responsibility is not to predict his ways. As the great hymn says, our responsibility is simply to trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. I'm not going to sing for you because I hear it's pretty bad, but you know the song. You see, while God's plan of salvation in Jesus Christ is a big picture example of how he works in mysterious ways, there are countless examples of this truth throughout history and in our own lives. We see this truth played out over and over and over again. God works in mysterious ways, ways we could never understand, ways we could never predict. Today we're beginning a study of the book of Esther. And Esther is a great example that God works in mysterious ways. Esther is a smaller scale example of the fact that God works in mysterious ways. So as we begin this study on Esther, we want to answer five questions. Five very basic questions. Who, when, where, why, what? Who, when, where, why, what? That's what we want to start with. All right? Let's start with the who. Who is Esther? Have you ever heard of the story of Esther? Who is she? Right? Esther, also known by her Hebrew name, Hadassah, was a Jewish woman living in the Persian Empire during the 5th century B.C. Now, this was post-exile. This was after the Jewish exile. We're going to talk about more. We're going to talk more about the when and the where in a minute, but it was post-exile. Through a series of very unlikely events, Esther becomes the queen of Persia. She marries King Ahuzeris. That's very hard to say. Ahasuerus. We're going to call him Xerxes, okay? Because that's easier to say, and that's his name in Persia. All right? The Persian name of the king is King Xerxes. So as we read Esther throughout the book, the king is often referred to as King Ahasuerus. But that's hard to say. His Persian name is King Xerxes, so we'll probably call him King Xerxes most of the time. Anyway, same guy, Ahus, Ahas, Urus, and Xerxes are the same guy. Sounds like I have a bad cold. Ahasuerus! Anyway, King Xerxes, okay? So Esther, through a, very, a series of very unlikely events, marries the king and becomes the queen, and in doing so, saves the Jewish people from annihilation. Amazing story. So that's who Esther is. We'll obviously learn a lot more about her. There are several other main characters in the story. Some of these characters you may have heard of, of course. There is Mordecai. All right, Mordecai is Esther's much older cousin. He is also her parental figure, her father figure in the story. Uh, he is a major influence in Esther's life. He plays a major role in the events of this book. There's also Haman the Agite. Haman is the villain of the story, if you will. Haman hates the Jews and desires to get rid of them. And then, of course, there is the king. As I've already mentioned, the book of Esther identifies him as King Ahasuerus. Uh, history identifies him as King Xerxes of Persia. Again, they are two names for the same man. Xerxes was his Persian name. Ahasuerus is merely his Hebrew name, or the, the Hebrew translation of his Persian name. As the author of the book is Hebrew, is Jewish, and speaks Hebrew, they use the Hebrew name. But they're the same guy. Uh, if you're a fan of the movies, you have seen this king portrayed in many different movies. For instance, if you've seen the movie 300, uh, the really creepy king that's the king of Persia, the bad guy. He's really tall and lanky, and he's bald, and he wears a lot of gold jewelry. Um, that's King Xerxes of Persia. That's the guy we're talking about. Um, 
If you want to see a very different portrayal of the same man, you can watch the movie One Night with the King. The movie One Night with the King is the story of Esther. And, of course, in that movie, he's not creepy at all. He's really good looking. He's got a nice beard. I mean, come on. Anybody with a beard, you got to like him, right? Um, so, very different portrayal, but same guy. King Xerxes or King uh, Hasuerus. Now, I know we've briefly already answered the where and the when, okay? Persia, 5th century. However, I want to go a little bit more in depth with that. To fully understand these events and to really appreciate what's going on in the timeline of salvation history, we need to know a little bit more about when and where, okay? So if you're here with us live, I provided an Old Testament timeline, and you should see those in your room. All right, so pick up that Old Testament timeline that I've provided and look at it. We're going to talk about that, kind of talk our way through that uh, today. If you're with us online, just kind of stay with us, okay? Understanding when and where this happens will give us a better understanding and a better appreciation of events. And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk through the whole Old Testament timeline, starting with the beginning. So the beginning, of course, is Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, uh, Genesis chapters 1 through 3, we have the creation of Adam and Eve, and we have the fall of mankind. So Adam and Eve are created, they're put in the Garden of Eden, they're kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Shortly after that, we have the account of Noah and the worldwide flood. That's in Genesis chapter 6 through 9. If we keep reading, we eventually come to Genesis chapter 12. Now, Genesis chapter 12 takes place around... 2090, 2100 B.C. Okay, so about 2,000 years before Christ was born. And that's when Abraham lived. Father Abraham, the father of the Jewish people. All right, in Genesis chapter 12, God promises Abraham that he's going to make him a great nation. We keep reading. We come to Genesis 46. We start reading of Jacob. Jacob is Abraham's grandson. And Jacob, Abraham's grandson, had 12 sons. These 12 sons become the 12 tribes of Egypt. And they moved to Egypt. Excuse me, 12, they become the 12 tribes of Israel. In uh, 1877 B.C., Jacob and the 12 sons moved to Egypt. Around 1805, Joseph dies. One of the sons dies. And shortly after that, the Hebrews are enslaved by the Egyptians, and that's in 1730 B.C. A little bit later, you have Moses. Moses leads the Exodus. So God calls Moses to deliver the people of Israel out of Egypt. This happens around 1447, 1446 B.C. Moses delivers the people out of Egypt where they've been enslaved. Uh, they receive the law on top of Mount Sinai. They start to become their own nation. Uh, by the time you get to 1 Samuel chapter 9, you have Saul. Saul becomes the first king of Israel. This is around 1051 B.C. Keep reading. You come to 2 Samuel, uh, 2 Samuel through 1 Kings, and you have the account of the rule of David and Solomon. David and Solomon are probably the most famous kings of Israel. This takes place in 1011 B.C. through about 931 B.C. King David and King Solomon ruled. Israel. They're very successful, very powerful. However, after Solomon, Israel is divided. They have a civil war, and they're divided into two separate nations, Israel to the north and Judah to the south. Israel is ruled by a man named Jeroboam, and Judah to the south is ruled by a man named Rehoboam, who is Solomon's son. However, both nations begin to disobey God. The north does so a lot quicker. And they are punished. The northern kingdom of Israel falls to the Assyrians in 722 B.C. This takes place in 2 Kings 17. Shortly after, Judah does the same thing. Judah falls to the Babylonians. So the Assyrians defeat Israel. The Babylonians then defeat the Assyrians. And the Babylonians come in and start taking over Judah. And this happens over a course of about 19 years. And there are three deportations. In other words, the Babylonians come in, take the Jews, and haul them off. We call this the exile. So the first deportation comes in 605 B.C. Daniel is part of this deportation. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or better known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're taken in this exile. 
You can read about this in 2 Kings 24, as well as Daniel 1. There's a second deportation a few years later in 598 B.C. This is Ezekiel. He's taken in this deportation. You read about that in 2 Kings 24, as well as Ezekiel 1. And then you have the final deportation in 586, 587 B.C. The Babylonians come in one last time, and they destroy the temple. They burn Solomon's temple to the ground. And you can read all about that in 2 Kings 25, 9. Okay, so after those three deportations, the Babylonians come in, defeat Judah, take people with them. The Israelites are now living in exile. Many of them are, are been yanked away from their homes and they're living in a foreign land. We call that the exile. However, there comes a point where the Babylonians are defeated by the Medes and the Persians. And Cyrus who is the king, issues what is known as the Edict of Cyrus. And the Edict of Cyrus tells all the Jews they can go home if they want to. The exile is over. They're allowed to go home, rebuild their homes, rebuild their city, rebuild the temple. Read about this in 2 Chronicles chapter 36. This happens in five, about 539 B.C. So a lot, some Jews go home. Not a lot. Most stay. But some Jews go home. They start to rebuild. The temple is rebuilt in 515 B.C. That brings us to about 486 B.C. when Xerxes becomes the king of Persia. And again, Xerxes is his Persian name. King Ahasuerus is his Hebrew name. He is the king in the book of Esther. He becomes king in 586. And in Esther chapter 2, he takes Esther to be his wife, and that happens in around 478 B.C. Shortly after that, Nehemiah uh, completes rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem, 445 B.C. Uh, Malachi is also prophesying during this time, and that's about where the Old Testament ends. <coughs> Excuse me. The Old Testament ends, and then you have several hundred years, what we call the silent years, where there is no word from the Lord. And then, of course, John the Baptist shows up on the scene announcing the coming Messiah. Whew, that's a lot of history, I know. If you're not a history buff, you probably were bored to tears. That's a lot of history. But I wanted you to see where the story of Esther fits into the timeline of the Old Testament. So this is after both, after Israel has been divided into two nations, and after both nations disobeyed God and were punished, the north by the Assyrians, the south by the Babylonians, they're taken away into exile, but God never fails to keep his promise. And God promised, hey, I'm going to bring you back home. And that's what we have happening. However, while many Jews are going home and rebuilding their homes, many Jews stayed. And that brings us to our next question. The question is why? Why do we have Esther still in Persia? Why do we find Mordecai still in Persia? If the Jews were allowed to go home at this point, the exile is over, why are they not back home in Jerusalem or in Israel rebuilding the city? Why are they still living in Persia? Well, the short answer is we don't know. We don't really know. A great many Jews decided not to return home. A great many Jews decided to stay wherever they are. In fact, one scholar, Joyce Baldwin, writes, the decree of Cyrus had permitted the return of captives from Babylon to Jerusalem in 539. Comparatively few had availed themselves of the opportunity either then or on later occasions. Very few returned. The majority stayed living in foreign countries. Why? Well, there are a lot of different reasons. There's a lot of speculation. The exile was 70 years long. A lot of people were too old to go home. It wasn't an easy journey to get back home. And so people who left in the exile, let's, let's say, you know, 20 years old, they're now 90. It'd be hard for them to go back home. So some were just too old to go back home. Some of the younger generations, they had lived their entire lives in the exile. Many of them were born. Most of them were born in the exile. They would have been accustomed to Babylon. They would have been accustomed to the comforts of this great empire. Quite simply, it had become their home. Many of them had attained positions of power. Think about Daniel. 
Okay? A lot of them become powerful, so they stayed. Others may have been concerned for their safety. The way home was not easy. The trip from Babylon to Jerusalem took about four months, and it was extremely dangerous. Finally, and this is sad but true, many of the Jews were living in disobedience. Many of the Jews had given up all hope of God fulfilling his promises to their nation. They had seen their nation fall. They had been living in exile. And even though God had warned them it would happen, they had lost their faith. They had no reason to go back home because they didn't believe the promises of God. Now, what was the motivation for Esther? What was the motivation for Mordecai to stay? We don't know. We don't know why they stayed. We don't know why they didn't go home. But here's what we do know, and this is what's important. This is what I want you to get. We do know that God had them exactly where he wanted them. Listen, God works in mysterious ways. Yes, Mordecai and Esther could have went home, but they didn't. They stayed. God had a plan. God knew he needed them there. And so they were exactly where God wanted them to be. They were exactly where God needed them to be because God works in mysterious ways. So now we turn to the what. We've talked about the who, we've talked about the when, we've talked about the where, we've talked a little bit about why. But now we want to talk about the what. What do we hope to learn from this study? What do we hope to learn from studying Esther? What do you think we can learn from, from her life? The primary theological theme in the book of Esther is the providence of God. Okay, that is the theme of this book. That's what we're going to see over and over, the providence of God. So what is the providence of God? Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines it as divine guidance or care. Oxford Dictionaries define providence as the protective care of God. Dictionary.com defines it as the foreseeing care and guidance of God or nature over the creatures of the earth. Forget that last nature part. We think it's about, you know, it's God. Okay. Biblically speaking, the doctrine of providence teaches that God is actively related to and involved in the creation at each moment. Okay, that's according to Wayne Grudem, theologian Wayne Grudem. He says God is actively related to and involved in the creation at each moment. Okay, God is not aloof. God is not up there in heaven ignoring us. God is actively involved. He goes on to say the biblical doctrine of providence teaches no, excuse me, does not teach that events in creation are determined by chance or randomness, nor are they determined by impersonal fate, but by God, who is the personal yet infinitely power, powerful creator and Lord. In, or, in other words, we don't believe in fate, we don't believe in luck, we don't believe in randomness. We believe God is in charge, and we believe God takes care of his plan and his people, and that is the providence of God. And that's what we see in the book of Esther. Haman, the bad guy, who we're going to see, wants to destroy all the Jews. And he's in a position to do it. He has the power to do it. But he's not more powerful than God. And so in God's providence, he has Esther and Mordecai right where he wants them to do exactly what he wants done. Now, providence, as we said, refers to God's personal care. It refers to God's protection of both his people and his plan. And God can do it because, as we said, he is omniscient and he is omnipotent. So he's fully capable of bringing about his plans for his people. And we see this throughout Scripture. Throughout Scripture, we see examples of both supernatural providence and natural providence. What's the difference? What's the difference in supernatural providence and natural providence? Supernatural providence refers to those times when God does the supernatural, okay? Miracles. God does the supernatural in order to bring about his plans for his people. So, for instance, the ten plagues of Egypt are an example of God's supernatural providence to protect his plan and his people. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego surviving a fiery furnace, and Daniel surviving the lion's den. Those are examples of God's supernatural providence to protect his plans and his people. Jesus Christ, okay, rising from the dead. 
That's an example of God's supernatural providence. Those are supernatural events. They are not things that happen in the natural war world. They are examples of God reaching into the history and doing stuff. Okay? That's supernatural providence. There's also God's natural providence. What's that? God's natural providence refers to those times when God does not do the supernatural. Instead, he uses natural occurrences and natural circumstances to protect his people and his plan. For instance, those times when we say God works in mysterious ways, that's often when God uses his natural providence. Nothing supernatural happened. No angelic beings were sighted. No, no oceans were parted. And yet everything works out just as God wanted it to. That's God's natural providence. And as we look at Esther, what we have is the perfect example of God's natural providence. Listen to me. In the book of Esther, nothing even remotely supernatural happens. Nothing supernatural happens. We're going to read the entire book of Esther. There are no angels. There are no miracles. Okay? In fact, the book of Esther is the only book in the entire Bible not to mention God by name. There are no miracles. There are no angels. God's name is not even mentioned. And furthermore, God doesn't even speak. We don't hear from God anywhere in the book of Esther. No supernatural beings, no angels, no miracles. That God is not mentioned and God doesn't speak. However, it is obvious from the events of Esther that God is involved. And that's what we mean by God's natural providence. Sometimes God is working behind the scenes in mysterious ways and we don't even know it. Now, while there are countless lessons we can learn from Esther, and we're going to talk about that. For instance, we're going to learn about the dangers of alcohol. We're going to look at pride. We're going to talk about hatred. We're going to talk about the importance of trusting God. We're going to talk about doing right no matter what the consequences are. There are a lot of great lessons from Esther. But again, God's providence is the main theme. It is the thread that runs throughout the book. God's providence. God can be trusted regardless of the circumstances. Even when we don't see God working, we can trust him. All right? Remember, he works in mysterious ways. Esther is a great Old Testament tr example of a New Testament truth. And that's found in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Romans 8, 28, the scripture says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. All things work for good. All things aren't good, but God can work all things for good. And that's what we're going to see as we study the book of Esther. As we look at Esther, each week we're going to take a then and now approach to this study. So every week we're going to start with the then. We're going to look at what happened, we're going to explain it, we're going to talk about it, we're going to understand it, and afterwards we're going to look at the now. But what does it mean for us today? How do we apply it? What lessons can we learn? So every week we're going to look at a chapter, and we're going to talk about the then, and then we're going to talk about the now. What happened then? How do we apply it now? All right? That's all the time we have for today. Next week, I want you to read Esther chapter 1. Next week's lesson is titled, An Invitation Refused. An Invitation Refused. I want you to read the whole uh, uh, Esther chapter 1. I want you to read Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1. Proverbs 14, 29. And Proverbs 23, 29 through 32. I also want you to read Ephesians 4.26 and Ephesians 5.18, 1 Corinthians 6, 8 through 10, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 again, and Romans 8.28 again. Those are important verses for this study. Some questions to ask yourself. Have you ever been invited to an event that you didn't want to go to? And what did you do? Do you notice anything interesting in Esther chapter 1 about the guests that are invited to the feast? Or about the duration of the feast. Look at those events. What's different? What's interesting? Why does, why does the king summon Queen Vashti? In chapter 1, the king's queen, his name is Vashti. Why does the king want her to come? What is the king rea king's reaction when she refuses? And then finally, what practical lessons can we learn? All right. 
We'll talk about all that next time as we look at Esther chapter 1. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for the opportunity to study this book of the Bible. I ask you to open our hearts and our minds as we do. Lord, show us how much you love us. Show us how much you want to take care of us. Show us your providence. Lord, I ask you to watch over us and protect us as we leave. In your name I pray. Amen. All right, guys, we'll see you next time as we look at Esther, chapter 1, an invitation refused. Uh-huh.